Jay Chandrasekhar, Kevin Heffernan, Steve Lemmy, yeah. and Eric Solansky. Yeah. Two, three, four. Welcome, guys. All right, uh, thanks. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Yeah, we're super pumped to guys, have you guys here at Google. We you know, saw the film last night. It is so phenomenal, and it has such a cool story of how you guys got it made, which was you guys started an Indiegogo, uh, basically, crowd starter campaign. And um, it was so, a crowdfunding campaign, and it was so cool to see that you guys announce it and then have the launch, and within a day or two, it basically backed up basically your goal, which was like $2 million, right? Yeah. And ended up with 4.75. Yep. That's nuts. And pretty so, good. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's not too bad. But humbling, very humbling. Very humbling. Uh, you know, we were pretty anxious about it going in. You know, uh, we knew that the studio in particular wasn't sure that the fans were still out there. And we had no idea how this was going to go down. And so we did a lot of preparation. We made content for, you know, the 30 days of the entire campaign. And uh, yeah, I mean, somebody bought the $35,000 squad car within the first hour or two. <laughs> uh, we got interest, a lot of save the dates uh, for our package to be uh, the groomsman at the, at the wedding. It was a $25,000 package. But yeah, we got uh, $2 million in 24 hours. Did you guys end up hours. doing that, the save the date we for did. the wedding? We tried. Yeah, we tried. Right. Somebody actually did a, an Indiegogo campaign to fund uh, bringing us to their <laughs> wedding. <laughs> but I don't think they raised the money for that one. But it could have gone the other way. I mean, it, right. you know, if, if people didn't Care. fund it, yeah. the studio would have said, well, we're, we're not making it. You know, we're not going to release a movie nobody wants to see. Yeah. Well, did you have any inkling in terms of, like, is this going to do well? Like, did you, did you, when you, before you did it, obviously you're nervous, but what, what made it now is, like, this is the time? Well, I mean, you know, movie making, uh, in order to think <clears throat> you can make a film starring you and your friends and get it into theaters, you have to be like uh, a real, real kind of dumb high stakes gambler, right? I mean, you, you, you make outrageous requests of people like to fund this movie with us in it. And, uh, and it, 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 sometimes it works, right? I mean, and, but so, so taking that risk was for us, we're like, sure. But also I think the first movie was a very grassroots kind of feeling movie, you know, it didn't have like a huge box office thing, but people saw it on DVD and they saw it in their living rooms and it had this feeling, this grassroots feeling, which I think the crowdfunding thing lent itself very well to, where people wanted to be directly involved in their own way. Yeah, because it did well in the box office, but really how, I mean, how I discovered it was actually on DVD. Yeah. And so, which is a market that doesn't exist. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to yeah. you guys. That's the problem thanks thanks to Northern California, right? <laughs> <laughs> Disrupting te technology. So sorry. Thanks. <laughs> was there, I guess in this era, though, when you have um, you have Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, but I guess the studio owned the rights, so they weren't allowing it to basically go. They, yeah, they the controlled IP. the rights to the sequel, and they basically they said to me, "We're not going to fund it, but we're never going to let you make it somewhere else because we don't want it to be a hit somewhere else and have us look bad." <laughs> so they said, "So you fund it, and then if it's a hit, then we'll fund the third one." Oh wow! Really? <laughs> Wow. That's that's the way it is. No. <laughs> <laughs> but so then they said they gave us parameters. They said we had to raise you know a certain amount to shoot the movie, and then also we had to raise the entire P and A, the prints and advertising budget, and they wow. set that at a, a ten million dollars. And so ultimately, the the raise we had to do was over twenty million dollars. Wow. And uh, and so the crowdfunding campaign really kicked that off. Um, you know, it got us four and a half million dollars. It got us the confidence of the studio, and it uh, enabled us to shoot for seven days and like 20 pages of the, of the movie. Um, and then we were able to get financiers on the back of that. But in the end, the studio came in and is paying for all the advertising. So right. Once they saw the movie. But I, we had to create the film first and sell it and make yeah. it successful, yeah. Right, and was there any point, I guess, I mean, because it's been 17 years now, I guess, since the original. So was there any point during the 17 years where you wanted to do a sequel right away? Or was there just not out of confidence? Because it did do. Uh, we didn't want to be. Um, you know, we didn't want to sort of follow and be the police academy guys. <laughs> it really, more than anything, it's like we wanted to make other movies so that we wouldn't be only known for that thing. So we made, you know, Club Dread and Beer Fest and right. Slam and Salmon, and now we're 
figured it was time to come back and grow the mustache. <laughs> and some didn't change. We had a history, of, a history of a sketch comedy group for five years before we made movies. We were doing live sketch comedy shows in New York City. So we always enjoyed try, trying different characters and different plots and stuff like that. Yeah, I want to talk about a little bit about the origins of Broken Lizards. So you guys all met in college, right? We're all part of yeah, the Yeah, we went to Colgate town. University. Colgate University? New York. Yeah. And was it always you five, or was it? No, it was 14. Mm -hmm. The first group yeah. was 14, 14. people. Yeah. And so were, was there ever, is there a lost member of Broken Lizard? <laughs> There's like, several. A lot of them, several. yeah, many. Yeah. yeah, but a lot of them, I mean, you know, like in New York, the, the only place that would allow us to perform when we were first in New York City was a gay cabaret club called The Duplex. <laughs> and, um, and the backstage, it was just a teeny little stairwell. It's probably like six stairs and an emergency exit. And, you know, I think that group started off with nine people. And uh, the core group here, like, we just bugged the shit out of those people so badly that they quit one by one. <laughs> like one guy, it was attrition. Yeah, one guy in his letter of resignation said that like, our mom jokes gave him headaches. <laughs> and he couldn't stand to be with us anymore. <laughs> so here we are. So then there's the fun. Yeah. So, um, so, but you guys, so the, the kicks or the, the Indiegogo started to 2015, right? It was fun in 2015. Yeah. Then you shot it in 2016 or 17? Well, it's kind of interesting. What we, what we found out is uh, we, we'd raised the money. Yeah. And then uh, it got to be kind of later in 2015. And then someone informed us that if we didn't spend the money by the end of the year, we had to pay taxes on the income. So whatever, you know, half of it would have to go away. <laughs> We'd have to go away to taxes if we didn't spend it. So uh, we immediately went into production, and we uh, <laughs> we shot for about six or eight days or something like that to 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 kind of start start the the ball rolling, and then that. Like Steve said, that's what helped us then raise the more money that we needed. Like and concept, and right? then we shot the it's rest of it in 2016. Yeah. But these, are, these are the questions that come up you know, in independent filmmaking, too, because the question that, that we debated was, all right, well, we've got this. It's $4.5 million. Should we just shoot, try to shoot the whole movie with this and do it really, really, really bare bones? And then, or should we just shoot a, a portion of it and make it you know, as kick-ass as we possibly can. So we shot the whole opening sequence that you okay. saw last night, um, and then a bunch of the pullovers in the Mountie uniforms, and, uh, and it turned out great. That was the whole thing also, is that we finished it in 2016, uh, then we shot, we finished that, then we did some, a little reshoot in 2017, then the movie was in the can, edited, mixed, and done in the summer of 2017, and we went to the Fox studio, and they said they were trying to figure out a release date, and we were hoping like late summer, or whatever it was, and they're like, you know, 420 falls on a Friday in 2018. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, we know, so what do you mean? It's like, we're thinking about waiting until 420 because we think it's the perfect release date for you guys. And we're like, that's eight months from now. Yeah, you know? it's a year off our lives. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, you know, ultimately the decision they made. It was a marketing decision. And then we were upset at the time, but at this point now, it just seems like a smart... They've created a holiday for us <laughs> <laughs> to release our movie. You know? And Jay, I guess you as the director of both films, um, now th that you had eight months to essentially sit on it, were, were you, was there any temptation to go back in and tweak it at all? You know, I watched it last night, and I'm like, there are about six changes I still want to make. <laughs> too late. Too late. Too late. Too late. It's, it's done. done. It's done. They've made thousands of prints. <laughs> <laughs> I just closed my eyes during those, those moments. <laughs> um, for you guys, I mean, you guys have obviously all right on the film, right? And wrote, the, wrote all these films from Broken Lizard. So um, what is that writer's room like when you guys are working together? It's fun. Uh, it's, I mean, it's really fun. We've known each other since college, so it comes pretty easily. Yeah, like trust trust riffing, you know, trust. I think we have a shorthand for how we work with each other. I mean, there's, you know, when we first started, you'd get into these ridiculous fights that would last, you know, hours over the stupidest joke or whatever it is. I think we've learned how to be a little bit more efficient since the, that time. And, uh, and we can insult each other and still come back the next day and be friends. And we can it's like family, disagree right? and whatever. But yeah, I think the bottom line of our writing room is if you can make the other guys laugh, it's going to get in the movie, you know? So that's your sounding board. Is, do you, does your decisions trump all oh. as a director? No. Say what? <laughs> <laughs> do you fight them on a lot of stuff, though? There's a, there's a, a bit from Steve's stand-up that these guys wanted to put in the movie because they, you know, they'd seen it on, uh, on the, on the stand-up station. It really worked really well. And they said, we should do this. This bit, it's like a. Is this in the car. We're, yeah, we're we're po we're posing as French-speaking Mounties, right? And so, there was a there's a very dirty joke that that he has. I won't ruin it, but it's a, a very dirty joke that if you say it in French, it sounds like something really dirty. 
And he's, they were like, let's put this in the movie. And I'm like, eh, it's more of a stand-up joke. And we fought for probably eight, seven or eight drafts. And they kept saying, let's put it in the movie. I'm like, ah, eh, no, I don't really like it. You know, and then I have to start insulting the joke. And then <laughs> finally we put it into the thing. And I'm like, fine, we'll shoot it. I'll just cut it later. Uh, and then because of some, I was in this one scene. And then we had to juggle it based on the plot. I end up now in this scene. And now I'm telling these jokes, and I'm like, I don't want to tell these damn jokes, right? <laughs> and then we shoot it, and we put it in the movie, and of course, it's the most popular scene in the movie. And I'm like, well, thank God I was in that, in that scene, right? So uh, that happens sometimes. Fighting for a joke sometimes like Survivor. you got to form alliances. There's five of us, and you try to get a majority. Right. Okay. So if you really like a joke, you sometimes try to form alliances. You get a majority. you got to sell it. you got to sometimes get out its feet and act it out. And then if they see it, it's like, okay, I get what you're doing with that. And they then kind of get on board. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it can be rough sometimes. If you believe in something, you just have to take a stand yeah. and keep coming back draft after draft <laughs> and, and making your pitch, and you'll take some ridicule. <laughs> and guys will insult like everything you stand for. <laughs> but eventually one day, like one guy will turn and be like, you know, now I like this fucking joke. And then you can see it start to yeah. happen. And then you have three of five, and you're like, it sticks. Yeah. Do you have bets back and forth? Because you do those in the movies. Is that coming from real life where you have bets back and forth where if this joke works, if this joke kills, then you got to do Yeah, I mean, Kevin and I are in the edit room, uh, and we will fight over whether a joke is funny or not. And then when we get in the final, like in the screening room last night, I'm like, Fuck you, dude. <laughs> I was Sometimes right. there's that silent, you know, yeah, yeah. reaction. And, and but like, what he always fuck does, you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> right. What he always does is like there'll be a like it'll be a big laugh at a joke I thought was great, and he'll go, it was more of a groan. <laughs> and then he'll never give in. <laughs> he'll never give but in. But th those are the best moments because it's like uh, we'll have the test screening in front of a live audience for the first time. It's not friends and family and the line is coming up, it's coming, and then it happens. And let's say there's a laugh. You'll just see like two guys who had the disagreement will just lean forward. <laughs> <laughs> you you record it for the laughs. And then you go back and you hear and you, you listen to see if anyone laughs at the joke when it's on the screen. Can you talk about a little bit about the filmmaking process that you guys, how it was back in the early 2000s? Because now we have social media, and now we have digital cameras, and everything is completely different than probably what you guys experienced back in yeah, I mean, the social media element is like when you make something uh, uh, artistic, you know you're going to be <laughs> attacked in some form, right? So it's like, it, it, it's just sort of the way, I mean, everybody has a voice now. Uh, Anonymous which is, voice. Which is too bad. But yeah. anyway, whatever. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's, fine. it's great. Um, but, it, you know, you just have to, you know, you have to really, I mean, it used to be that you'd open the New York Times and they would insult your movie and then... And you know you're like, oh, my, my friends and relatives are reading this thing, but now it's literally on all over Twitter and everywhere, right? So it's just the way it goes. I mean, there's a lot of you know you just have to try to keep the positive wave going, you know. Right, right, right. Um, Thick skin. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and then in terms of your shooting stuff, you have continued to direct and shoot um, a lot of series as well. And so, um, how have you evolved, I guess, essentially as a filmmaker? Like, what did you, I guess, learn? from your you know, decades of working on film into that you put into this film? You know, I sh I've shot over 100 uh, episodes of television. So uh, I've shot you know, 25 sex scenes and 25 fights and a bunch of dinner scenes. And, and I tried different lenses and different scenes and handheld and dollies. And I, I kind of figured out what I like the most. And then when we make a film, I just do that favorite version of it. And so it's, it's made things, you know, like all the decision making and how should I shoot this, all that time that I would have spent thinking about it, now I, I already have an opinion about it. And as you guys are writing your characters and, and writing this together in the room, um, you obviously have probably strong opinions for your characters and maybe other characters. Who's the most challenging to write for and who's the most fun to write for? <laughs> well, I think we had a policy for a long time and obviously the sequel kind of blew it out of the water, but what we always did was we would not cast the script until we had written multiple, multiple drafts. Because that's what happens. Like a guy will be like, oh, it's my character. I didn't think about my jokes. But if you keep it, you know, without being cast, you know, you can write for everybody. And so we had a, a kind of a, a long process where we did that. This one was a little different now because, you know, you already knew what character you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And then anything that was just fucking insane, they just gave to my character. Yeah. <laughs> we all write for him. Yeah, no. So, yeah. no, but those are, the, those are the fun things. It's like we, with Super Troopers, we did a table read with each guy playing different roles, basically oh, wow. auditioning to see, you know, for different parts. I was supposed to read Farva after uh, Kevin. And so he read Farva, and then we were done with that. And we're like, all right, let's go again. Steve, do you want to? You ready to play Farber? I was like, nah. <laughs> it's good. I think we're done here. <laughs> we had tried it beforehand. Yeah, I tried Farva, he tried Farva. <laughs> and then he got Farva like, you got it. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. He's got it. Yeah. Because we're just not, we're not as big a dicks as you. That's right. <laughs> it's the asshole quotient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when you're, um, when you're uh, writing a sequel, a lot of times what happens is, which does not happen in this film, which is really, really rare in terms of a lot of sequels, they end up tending to be basically a lot of the same jokes and a lot of the same stuff, but you guys handle it really well where, yes, you do reference Meow and funny things like that and like Gafgan and stuff, but you aren't, you aren't retreading the same stuff. It's like new jokes, but kind of referencing the old, but it's, it's well, really, we, really great. We exist in the same world that you do, right? right. So. We're aware of the issues with comedy sequels as well. And so we approached it with that mentality, not to go down that kind of road. And there wasn't any pressure from the studio to be like, you have to follow the structure. Or well, the pressure was pressure more internal. The studio is if they finance yeah. it, but they didn't finance it. So they're, they're <laughs> you guys did, yeah. So. But I think yeah. amongst us, there were different opinions about how much, how referential should it be versus, you know, versus not, you know. I think. I think what we settled on ultimately is we would take maybe one of the old jokes and then we'd put new spins on it. Yep. And then it allows you to reference it, but at the same time have a new laugh in there. You know, so. And the fans, too. The fans will be like, OK, you've got to. Uh, you got to bring back the stoners, and you have to bring back the local cops, and you have to do pullovers. You should do the meow game. We want to see the bulletproof jockstrap again for sure. <laughs> but don't you dare make the same movie as the first one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and like, I guess shenanigans, meow. Is that stuff from real life that you guys are pulling from? Yeah, no, no, I, I think that's the thing. Like, we, I think a lot of times we do our best writing when we're hanging out together outside yeah. of making the movies, and then, you know, a funny thing will pop up and, uh, you like, know, oh, make everybody laugh, like and it's like, hey, let's figure out how to stick that in there, you know? Make and that's sure. what we end up doing. I want to talk a little bit, go back to the Indiegogo can can campaign, because there was some really interesting, we did mention the best men at a wedding um, that we talked about. Um, there was one for naming rights um, in the film for names of characters or towns. Does that make it in? Oh, yeah. There are a few it's people. In, yeah. This guy, Shoddy Fitznugly, gets his name mentioned. <laughs> One of my favorite lines in the movie, too. That's right. I got to deliver that line, and I loved it. Yeah, there's like four, uh, four or five names of guy, people who donated an Indiegogo, and their names are in the movie in one way or another. And it's funny, because we did get studio notes on the cut of the movie, and they'd be like, why do you say the name Shoddy Fitznugly? What is that? <laughs> or why is this Matt so-and-so? Why is that name in there? Why don't you cut for time, cut that line out? I'm like, well... They're investors. Yeah. <laughs> we have to put that we in. We have to put that in. They've earned it. Um, the most ridiculous one, which there were very, very shockingly no takers, the indecent proposal. I'm going to read this because this is ridiculous. Okay. This is it. End of the line. If you kick in $25 million and provide our entire, entire dream budget, we will be so grateful that one of us will father your child, in all caps. <laughs> Selling sex as a perk isn't allowed yet, and our wives would murder us, but one of us will act as a sperm donor and giving your child a celebrity DNA. You don't know which one, though. Yeah. You don't know which one you of them. thought about putting a salad. <laughs> just be. And they put a salad spinner, spin it up, and then uh, <laughs> kind of guess. We thought, you know, it'd be funny. We do that, and then you don't know who you're getting. So if your yeah. kid comes out Indian, then you know who it is. Or <laughs> if your kid's fat, then, you know, or short, or whatever it is. You know? But maybe it's a hybrid where it comes out short, fat, Brown and blue eyed. <laughs> there you go. That's with all a mustache. Of us. Yeah. Um, are, uh, but after reading that, I'm thinking, there, were there any prizes that you didn't include because they were too ridiculous? Because that is, I don't know how you can get more ridiculous than that, but you probably can think. Well, of it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Like we didn't even realize, uh, you know, a lot of this, the crowdfunding, it is, you know, a cost benefit analysis versus like, like how much of your time can you spend to fulfill the perks versus the money you raise. Mm. And, and this is another thing we didn't even realize, like, you know, you raise four and a half million bucks and you end up having like 30, 40% go to the overhead of, of fulfilling that. And then, you know, so I think it was a, a thing about trying to make sure that whatever we did was not uh, so expensive or time consuming that it made it kind of ridiculous to do, you know. I think we were going to do like, you know, private screenings in people's basements or backyards, have like parties, but it was so time consuming. You just couldn't find it in the schedule to like find the time to fly to a middle of Oklahoma and that would take a whole three party. days flying there and partying back. 
Yeah, yeah, I got you. Is there anything that you guys um, wish that you could have included in the film, but as you start going through the editing and stuff, you're just like, mm, that doesn't really work, but then you watch the final film, you're like, shit, I wish I put that in. I mean, we, we, we cut it, and we try to put all the very best stuff in it. I yeah. mean, it, it doesn't, it's, it's not really a situation where you left out something great. But I think there's time. a timeliness issue, though, too. Like, yeah. when we shot the first one, like we were talking about, was 2015, 2016. I mean, that was... It was a it was a joke that Donald Trump was running for president in 2015. You know what I mean? And now it's a different world. So like you can't really make those like you saw it last night. We have a we have a Stephen Hawking joke in the movie, and now it looks like it's in poor taste. And it wasn't. <laughs> it was shot two years ago. It's not you know it wasn't intended to be in poor taste. But now people are like oh you know so that that creates a little bit of a problem. Is I there think. is there anything um, from the first film that is uh, it's a lot of it like sneaks into the pop culture like kind of general just when you're talking to friends like, I got you good, you fucker, or right now, and that kind of stuff where it surprises me that people sometimes don't associate that with the movie. They're like, oh yeah, people just say that. It's like, well, no, that actually came from this film. Like, does anything like that surprise you guys in terms of a line that you're like, I can't believe that caught on? Yeah, I mean, that meow thing has ended up on posters and t-shirts. Mm -hmm. People get tattoos of it. Yeah. Yeah. Target. Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> Baseball players sneak it into interviews, yeah. you know? <laughs> But you do, you do, you do every, like, you just run across these things where you appreciate the fandom that they're, like, we had, someone came to our show, and they, over the years, they had collected our autographs, and then they tattooed our autographs onto their forearm, and you're like, Jesus, what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, that's a fan, there, right? There are some horrified-looking faces. <laughs> yeah, like, but, they were, I mean, that's how we felt. We're like, why'd you do that? You know? <laughs> I mean, that meow joke happened because we were all in a room at about 4 or 5 in the morning, and we were, we were, we were smoking in, like a, in a motel. We were all living five in this. We were just staying in the motel while we were pitching TV. And we riffed on this idea that a wizard, what if a wizard turned your tongue uh, into like a, a, a cat. And, the, and uh, but the only way you'd know is because the, the cat would, would substitute the word meow for now. <laughs> and we laughed about that for like hours. <laughs> and somebody wrote on a napkin, meow equals now. And then three weeks later, when we were in a writing meeting for Super Troopers 2, someone pulled out the napkin. You were like, remember this joke? And you're like, yeah, how are we going to do that, though? And we kind of revamped it and reworked it and put it in. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was the scene that every we went to every studio to try to get money for the movie, and every studio passed on it, and they would talk about that scene. They were like, like for instance, we don't understand this scene here on page 55. Yeah. It's got all these meows one after the other. Like, <laughs> you say meow. It's like, two and a half pages of mostly meows. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? How does that advance the story? <laughs> What is your guys' uh, biggest pet peeve? Shouldn't bother me, and I know half the country does it, but I hate <laughs> when people say, I'll do a margarita. <laughs> I, sit there, that I sit there seething. I'm like, will you? Will you do it? <laughs> I hate it when a, when a waiter says, I've got uh, three lamb chops left tonight. I've got a uh, nice cut of filet mignon. Like, he, you don't got You don't it. got that. <laughs> you don't got that. <laughs> I also hate when a waiter asks me if I've ever been there before. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a none restaurant. Of your fucking business. <laughs> I'm gonna order food. Let's do it. <laughs> What's the matter if you've been there before? I guess. I guess that's. Who cares? Good. You just hate restaurants. <laughs> I love to see Brian Cox back, and I thought that was so yeah, he's fun great. to see him because he's gone like really serious. And then I'm like, so was that a struggle to get him back, or was he like, no, I'm game? Uh, oh, he, he, was, he, was he loved it. He's fine. He was psyched. I mean, he, you know, he's a guy when he did the first one. You know, he kind of lamented the fact that. He didn't get offered comedies a lot. You know what I mean? He's a serious actor, and he doesn't get to do comedies. And a lot of these actors, they just want to do something funny. You know, so when they get that opportunity, they embrace it. So I think when the second time came around, he was happy to come back and do it again. He was original Hannibal, and so you know, everyone saw him as a serial killer. No one really could see him as playing a comedic role. And so when our script went out on the wires, his agent actually read it and sent us Brian's headshot and said Brian would love to play that part. Wow, I, I want to talk about Rob Lowe as well because he's also in this. He plays a character, and he's ridiculous in this. And it's so funny because he does some ridiculous things. Was that tough getting him to do? He has gone actually more comedy, um, you know, in the past few years and stuff. But was that tough to get him kind of on board with that? Uh, I worked with Rob on a, on a television right. show, and he was uh, 
I always joked with him that he was like a comedian stuck in a leading man's body because he's a very funny guy and his rhythm is perfect. You, you know? see it in Parks and Rec. And yeah, you see he's a very, very stuff. funny and guy. And he's extremely good looking. And he's so good looking. <laughs> uh, but I said to him, you know, I said, Do you, would you ever consider being in Super Troopers? He goes, yes, any part. I don't even need to see the script. Wow. And, you know, we have a joke in there that is, I'm not going to ruin it, but it's, it's a really outrageous joke that he has to do. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want to show him that joke because he'll say no. He'll read the script and be like, I can't ruin my whole reputation for this movie. <laughs> so we cut the joke. And these guys are like, we're not cutting the joke. You're going to make him do that joke. <laughs> and I'm like, I'll do it. Let's get him in the movie. So we got him in the movie, and then we, we were shooting the scene. And these guys are like, get over there and tell him to do the joke. <laughs> So I did. And I started to tell him the thing, and he goes, oh, yeah, we have to do that. <laughs> and, uh, and then he really elevated it, too. So That's a scene. hopefully we don't ruin his career. It's but uh, a scene in the bar. Will Sasso, isn't it? Yep. With Canadians in terms of learning about any of the law or anything like that, because there is that border territory war. I mean, I've spent a lot of time shooting television in Canada, so I have... Uh, You're aware of it. You know, there's... They, they are, uh, you know, they're obviously a smaller country by population and they're they're convinced that we're thinking about them right and I said we're not right and they're like no no I mean you know we, we all know about the the United States government supporting the separatist movement in Quebec because they're trying to cleave that's their word cleave the country of Canada in two so that the, the, the U.S. will then sneak up and take all the Western oil, oil interests and leave the East Coast because it's, it's poorer. And I said, nobody's ever said that down there. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought that'd be kind of a, like, you know, because we thought that that's sort of, that's sort of a, a, a thing that sort of is, is, is a part of how the Canadians feel in this movie. It's like they don't like us coming up there. And, it's true. I'll tell you this. You guys don't know this. This is hot off the presses. Um, uh, we just received a letter, I swear to God, from uh, the Royal Mounted Canadian Police accusing us of using their IP illegally. And uh, they've, sent, they've sent a legal letter to us now to cease, cease and desist. desist. It's in your inbox. <laughs> it just wow. came in like an hour ago. Yeah. Wow. So, Delete? <laughs> Junk we'll mail? We'll go to war over that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do? That's funny. You go, Stop us. You go up to Canada and they're like, wow. you know, we, did, we burned down the, the White House in the War of 1812, eh? <laughs> and you look at them funny. And then, you know, you go look it up on Google, and uh, <laughs> discover that, no, that actually did not happen. They rented out their land to the British so the British could do it, uh, <laughs> just so you know. There's but it's in, it's in their history books that they burned down. Yeah, oh, they burned down. but they didn't. Um, <laughs> the success of the first movie and the fandom around it, were there a lot of celebrities in Hollywood that reached out to you asking to be a part of the film? I mean, you just mentioned Rob Lowe, but um, were there anyone who was like, oh, i got to be in your next? Uh, there, there are. There, there were, and we we put some of them in, uh, and they're they're not in the trailer because we kind of wanted to reveal uh, them in the, when you go see the movie. Hey guys, uh, one sequel in the can. Any updates on another potential sequel, aka <laughs> Pot Fest yeah. slash Smoke Fest? This is the problem. We make one, and now you want a different one. You haven't seen it yet. <laughs> you haven't seen it yet. No, but that was actually one where it's like that was supposed to be a joke at the end of Beer Fest. It says, you know, you know, Willie shows up and. I'm part of Super Secret Weed Smoke competition, coming soon, Pot Fest. Uh, and then all the Hollywood stoners came out of the woodwork back then. It was, I mean, well, Willie was like, we are making this fucking movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> and Snoop Dogg, you know, said, Method you know, he, Man yeah, came to our office. 50 Cent uh, invited us for a meeting with him to, uh, <laughs> everybody wanted to be it. So, you know, we, we're, if the movie does well, if Super Troopers 2 does well opening weekend, then that conversation can certainly happen. Our future depends on 420. <laughs> I think for a lot of uh, comedians or actors who've had like cult successes, they often get defined in their career by that, and it can probably come back to haunt you. Do you guys have any like hilarious stories of being pulled over by the police <laughs> and having them do things to you and just being like, "You please just give me a ticket." <laughs> uh, I got pulled over doing uh, 120 miles an hour. Um, I was driving uh, from LA up to San Jose on the 5 North. If you've been on that, it's hundreds of miles of pure, pristine, straight black highway. And I was on the highway after midnight. I was one of the only cars there. I was doing 120. I was 
fired up about the fact that there were no cops on this highway. <laughs> uh, and just when I was really feeling cocky about it, boom, the guy got me. And uh, this cop came up to the car and he was, he was so mad. He was like, Mr. Do you have any idea how fast, super troopers? <laughs> I was like, you got me. He's like, oh my God, you guys are hilarious. We play all those games you guys play. <laughs> we play the meow game, we would play the repeater. I was like, bulletproof jockstrap. He's like, oh, we're not that fucking crazy. <laughs> but then he went on to admit that Super Troopers was his favorite movie and that uh, his nickname was Mac after my character. Uh, and then he let me out of the speeding ticket. <laughs> uh, and there we were on the side of the road, you know, taking selfies. <laughs> And people are driving by like, what the fuck? <laughs> so that's happened to all of us, by the way. Uh, I'd love to know your favorite uh, character, Broken Lizard or otherwise, that uh, you guys have each played or written. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll say Farva. I mean, I got to say Farva because he's so fucking crazy. It's like, you know, you, do, you get to do shit that you aren't really allowed to do in the real world when you play a crazy asshole, you know what I mean? And it allows me to, I don't know, be a jerk, I think, which I think is a lot of fun. Yeah. Like that's what it, we, we try to mix it up in our movies, where one guy is the crazy guy or the two-dimensional guy, and I think we all try to lobby to get that part because that's always the fun part of play. Fun. You know, you're really good at it. Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> really, just add gum and yeah. <laughs> mustache and gum, and yeah, you're off to the races. Instant farmer. Uh, I like playing um, Juan Castillo in Club Dread, uh, just because you know I got to do an entire movie in a speedo <laughs> and make out with everybody. It was awesome. You had a great accent, too. Thank you very much. That's my dad's accent right there. Uh, I played a character, Freaky Reeky, in Puddle Cruiser, which probably no one in this room has seen, but it was a movie we made before Super Troopers. And uh, like Kevin said, it's the kind of far out character. I played this long hippie with long hair and earrings. And uh, it was fun to go shopping for that kind of character and get into that kind of weirdness. Uh, I think I probably liked playing uh, uh, Barry Badranath. Uh, you know, it's it's fun to play like a you know male prostitute, but try to give it humanity. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy that. I guess my question is really about uh, with the current industry, with you know the Netflixes and the Amazons kind of throwing a lot of money around, and movies being made and TV shows. Is there any interest in you guys? doing some sort of a sketch comedy TV series or anything like that. Obviously, creating a movie is very difficult, takes a long time, but TV shows might be a little bit easier to pump out and allows you guys to kind of switch between different characters as you guys are used to in your, in your sketch comedy background. Are you offering? <laughs> I wish. It's crazy. It's, the landscape has changed so much. Like, you used to go into ABC, Fox, and NBC, and CBS and pitch a sitcom and you'd be like, and you know, we could do like maybe this episode and this episode. And now with like Netflix and Amazon, you actually have to have a finished script and a whole Bible and all prepared. And then you go, I mean, you go to like Netflix and Amazon, those reception areas. It's like a zoo over there now. There's like you, yeah. pockets of, of creative teams. They've, they're all sitting with a, a celebrity. Like you're like, oh, there's Josh Duhamel. <laughs> and uh, they're going to go, and there's Edie Falco. They're going to go pitch a TV show with that celebrity there. It's absolutely a phenomenal film. I'm so excited for everyone else to see it. So it comes out on 420, Super Troopers 2. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you.